Welcome, everybody. Oh, goodness. Welcome, everybody. Is that a little better? OK, there we go. This year, Barnard celebrates 125 years as the premier liberal arts college for women. Barnard remains devoted to and impassioned by empowering extraordinary women to become even more exceptional. And as a world-renowned distinguished leader in liberal arts education, Barnard attracts students and academics from all over the world. In celebration of our anniversary, we will be hosting over 60 panels and talks throughout the year, most of which are free and open to the public. We hope you will join us again to celebrate this exciting milestone. My name is Dr. Rebecca Calisi Rodriguez, and I am proud to be an assistant professor of biology here at Barnard. I study how the brain controls sexual behavior and reproduction. I'm also heavily involved in efforts to support the advancement of women and underrepresented minorities in science. So it should be of no surprise to you that the topic of sex, genders, and brains really gets me jazzed. But now it is my pleasure to and honor to introduce our moderator for our exciting and integrative discussion tonight, Natalie Angier. Natalie Angier attended one of the most highly esteemed liberal arts colleges in the country, <laughs> Barnard, <laughs> where she studied English, physics, and astronomy. She graduated with high honors, and at the young age of 22, she was hired as a founding staff reporter and writer for Discover. She also worked as a senior science writer for Time Magazine, served as an editor at the women's business magazine, Savvy, as a professor of journalism at NYU's graduate program in science and environmental reporting, and as an Andrew D. White professor at large at Cornell University. In 1990, Angier began writing for the New York Times, covering genetics, evolutionary biology, medicine, and many other subjects. Soon after, she won a Pulitzer Prize for beat reporting for a series of 10 feature articles on a wide array of scientific topics. Among them, the biology of scorpions, disputes over the Human Genome Project, the importance of parasites in evolution, and the ubiquitousness of philandering in the animal kingdom. It's my favorite. Since then, Angier has continued to bring to life a vast array of subjects, from telomeres to cotton top tamarinds, women's health issues to why we laugh and beyond. Her books include Natural Obsessions, an inside look at the high throttle world of cancer research, which was named a notable book of the year by the New York Times and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. The Beauty of the Beastly, a hymn to the various mostly invertebrate creatures which some, not me, would rather forget, which was also cited as a New York Times notable book. And Woman, an Intimate Geography, a celebration of the female body and biology, which was a National Book Award finalist and New York Times bestseller, and in which a new edition has just been published. I have mine. <laughs> One of her latest works of brilliance is her book, The Canon, a whirligig tour of the beautiful basics of science. Beautifully written, filled with sparkling prose and memorable metaphors, the canon serves as a guide to the fundamental concept of mo concepts of modern science that researchers in all the major scientific disciplines, such as physics, chemistry, biology, geology, and astronomy, and more, wish that everybody understood about their work. So it must come as no surprise that Andrea has received numerous awards and honors, including the American Association for the Advancement of Science Prize for Excellence in Science Journalism, the Lewis Thomas Award for Distinguished Writing in the Life Sciences, membership in the American Philosophical Society, the General Motors International Award for Writing About Cancer, Multiple Publishers Award from the New York Times, and the Freedom From Religion Foundation's Emperor Has No Clothes Award, and of course, the most important of them all, the Barnard College Distinguished Alumna Award. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our moderator for this evening's event, our beloved and distinguished Barnard alum, Natalie Angier. so much, I'm never going to live up to that introduction. Um, so, I just want to start with a little brief view of 
the real differences between the sexes. Um, <clears throat> One of these PCs, like I don't know what to do. Uh, can you just tell me? Ah, there we go. Mm. <coughs> Can't I get rid of that stuff on the side? Mm. Okay. So, take a look at this. I mean, really, really look at it because this was used to illustrate this article that appeared in this uh, online journal called Cerebrum, Dana Foundation, sort of popular neuroscience journal. And it was used to illustrate an article on. Uh, the sex differences. And so you can see now what they are. Male brain, computer, math. The one on the right. Ah, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I see what you're saying. No, but this is the, you can see that's the male nose. Okay, so this is a. <laughs> So yes, computers and molecules, math, uh, I guess that star is astronomy, um, and I guess that's chess pieces, or maybe they're keyholes for peeping through, I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> and then <laughs> there's a female brain, and this is of course what we think about all the time, flowers and music, perfume bottles, stiletto boots, and uh, teacup that kind of looks like a thong. Um, <laughs> and of course, we, we think about love a lot. So uh, when I first saw this illustration, this is just in April, this looks like it should have been from about 40 years ago, but it was very recent. And I sent it on to some of my female scientist friends who were just absolutely outraged and they got very upset and they got in touch with the guys here and they took it away with a thousand apologies. But I think that the point has been made here that a lot of discussions about sex differences devolve into something rather cartoonish and that we have to be very careful not to do that. And the reason I think we have to be careful is because I actually think that these things have a subliminal effect. I think that when you start coming to these sweeping conclusions that the data don't merit, you can actually undermine a lot of, of good work that we're trying to do. Um, I think that Larry Summers' comments of uh, five years ago or so, no, like 10 years now, were, were actually very uh, detrimental. And I think he's lived to regret them. <clears throat> Janet Yellen is now. Federal Reserve Chairman. So I think that we need to be very careful. And I also wanted to talk about, just briefly, um, another, uh, let's see, here we go. Yep. Yeah, the problem is I kind of have to look at the screen. Um, so I just wanted to talk also about uh, kind of an object lesson in jumping to conclusions. So there was this very interesting paper that just came out. Um, let's see, it's, uh, the title is Human Preferences for Sexually Dimorphic Faces May Be Evolutionarily Novel. Uh, what that dimorphic means, of course, uh, two different shapes. So the, there's been a lot of research done on what makes people attractive, what makes men attractive to women, what makes women attractive to men. And the assumption was that uh, if you have this kind of highly feminized or highly masculinized face, that that's going to be even more attractive, that you have these kind of exaggerated uh, qualities in the same way that the peacock's tail is exaggerated or the, the horns of the antlers on a 
a male um, deer are exaggerated. So the assumption was, and based on a lot of research, that if you take these images and you sort of ultra-feminize them or ultra-masculinize them, that they're going to be considered more attractive. So you have here in the middle, you have the original image, and then the one on the left is the, um, the more masculinized image by about 60%, and the one on the right is uh, feminized. And this is held true for a lot of cultures that have been looked at. So the literature looked to be overwhelmingly in support of this principle. <clears throat> but unfortunately, most of the research that was done, and this is true with a lot of this kind of research, is done on what's called weird cultures, that is, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, um, developed countries. And very little had been done on you know, a variety of, of more traditional cultures. And when they, so there was this paper now showing that when they actually went to some of these smaller, either uh, foraging or pastoral societies and did these same kinds of studies, that there was, in a lot of cases, no preference for the feminized face or the masculinized face, and in some cases, the opposite. So what you have is another example of getting ahead of ourselves, getting ahead of the data, getting ahead of what the studies show. And I think that that's another thing that we have to always be careful of with this kind of research. So um, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, sex differences, but also, I think, sex similarities and what differences we know about, um, what they mean, what they don't mean, what we don't know. and. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel of people who will be addressing it from different perspectives. Um, <clears throat> you just have to bear with me with this. Uh, so first up, we are going to have Arthur Arnold, um, distinguished professor of integrated biology and physiology at the University of California in Los Angeles. He's going to be talking about some of the more important studies that have been done, animal studies, that uh, show significant structural and functional sex differences and where they come from, hormonal, chromosomal, and so on. So he's going to give us a nice, uh, solid foundation for this. Um, <clears throat> and then we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Ray Silver. And she's going to be continuing along that line, looking at some of what we know, what the research has shown. She's uh, the Helene L. and Mark N. Kaplan Professor of Natural and Physical Sciences, Departments of Psychology, Barnard, and Columbia University. And then we'll be hearing from Rebecca Jordan Young, who's the Associate Professor and Chair of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies here at Barnard. And author of a, a really great book called Brainstorm, The Flaws in the Science of Sex Differences. And she will be talking about the flaws in the science of <laughs> sex differences, among other topics. And uh, Daphne Joel, who's professor of School of Psychological Sciences at uh, Tel Aviv University. And she's going to kind of continue along that line of skepticism, informed skepticism, not just knee-jerk skepticism like we're always accused of. And she's going to be arguing that the brain is not, in fact, male or female, but a mosaic, that there are sort of male parts, female parts, you know, the sort of math parts and flower parts, and that they're kind of all mixed together. Um, and what does that mean? And, you know, how does this apply to our everyday lives and our understanding of ourselves and what it means to be a man or a woman in 21st century America? I'm also hoping that we'll veer off into related subjects like uh, sexual orientation, and this is a, a related topic, and there's been a lot of work on whether or not it's how innate is it, is it, you know, learns, is it a choice, is it, you know, is it something that uh, is thrust upon us, what, what does it mean to have sexual orientation, is there a difference between 
being a, a gay man or a gay woman is one more innate than the other. I think that there's been a lot of debate about that lately and it's an interesting topic. And then transgender, which is very, very popular right now. It's really been amazing to me to watch how it just kind of caught on. We have shows like Transparent about uh, a man who comes out to his adult children as a woman. And then we have, of course, the one of the favorite characters in Orange is the New Black, who is a transgender woman. And it's also filtering down to children, which really surprises me, because years ago it was, you know, you see transgender, but kids, you always had to say male or female. And um, now there's a whole debate about whether or not you can have boys who dress up like girls and use the girls' bathroom and what's it mean and how young do you have to be before you can declare that you're actually one or the other sex. So this has been a really recent phenomenon, very interesting. What does it mean? What does transgenderism mean to understanding maleness and femaleness? So without further ado, I will call up the first speaker, Dr. Arthur Arnold, who will give us that foundation of uh, animal studies and what we know and don't know. Thanks very much. Um, let's see, I have to pull up my... <coughs> so it's a, it's a kind of a long title. But um, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the biology of sex differences, uh, biological factors that make males and females different. And um, to kind of give it, I'm going to try to give it a little bit per of a personal spin um, as, um, and, and start uh, actually in New York City in uh, 1970. Uh, this, in fact, is a picture of me with my wife and uh, firstborn. Um, I was a graduate student in New York City uh, right at the first uh, eight years of, of my marriage. So two important things happened to me in, in New York. It's great to be back. Um, the, the first was that this was, in fact, the beginning of, um, of our marriage and our life together. Um, so that's an important personal uh, thing. This is where we started. Both of our kids were born in New York Hospital. But the other thing um, that is the rest of the talk is, is an intellectual journey. Um, that began at the Rockefeller University when I was a grad student and began studying uh, sex differences. Um, I was a student of Fernando Nodebaum, and um, at about four or five years after that first picture was taken, we uh, discovered that in, this, in songbirds, uh, that there are remarkably large structural sex differences in the brain. So here's the zebra finch. The zebra finch is a, is a native of Australia. Some of you may have had zebra finches as pets. You can buy them around the world. They're popular cage birds. They breed in captivity, and they're pretty little birds. Um, the male sings a courtship song to the female, turns her on. Um, they uh, build a nest. Um, they copulate. She lays eggs. They both incubate and take care of the young. But this male courtship song is not sung by the female. She, in fact, as far as we know, can't sing that song. They both vocalize, they both have things to say other than this song, but the male has uh, this prerogative to sing this song. And um, when I was a grad student, uh, Nodabom discovered a series of brain regions, a whole network actually, that were quite discreet. Like if you, th these are pictures of brain sections on the right side here, viewed through the microscope. Um, and you're looking at about a, a one fourth of a brain section here. And the, this, um, I guess there's a, so this um, kind of roundish brain region is involved in singing in the male, and in the female it's greatly reduced. The brain regions controlling song, this whole network, are maybe five times larger in males than females. And, and at the time, was, this was the first time that anybody had seen really <coughs> remarkably large sex differences in the brain. So this drew our interest, and in fact, 
changed the whole trajectory of my research career so that I've been studying uh, sex differences ever since. Um, now, I think it's important that we all, all four speakers, talk about the words we're <clears throat> using a little bit because it gets confusing because the word male and female and sex and gender are used differently by different people. So I just want to say what, how I'm going to use those words. Um, <clears throat> I'm talking about uh, biological uh, factors, things that come from within the animal, not from outside the animal. And I'm only gonna be talking about animals, okay? So males are um, animals with testes and make sperm, and uh, females are animals with ovaries and make egg cells. And it's a fairly clean uh, division as long as you stay with animals and um, don't go beyond that. But it'll get more complicated, I think, as the four speakers um, develop their own um, stories here. Um, and although I'm only talking about animals, I do think that what we learn from animals informs the conversation when we get to humans. Because, of course, evolution didn't stop um, um, at when, when primates evolved. Um, and a lot of the same biological processes are common among, um, certainly among the mammals and the vertebrates. And so if we look at, uh, at other animals besides ourselves, um, we can um, learn some principles that may, um, as I say, inform the conversation. So at that time, when we found these huge sex differences in the brain of, of the songbird, um, um, if we ask where do these sex differences come from, there were really two answers at that time based on theories and experiments that had been done before that. One was that the hormones circulating in the adult animal can make sex differences because males have testes and testosterone at a higher level than the female. Female has ovaries and ovarian hormones that are a bit different than the testicular hormones. Both sexes have all of these hormones, but there are different levels. And so maybe those are what create the sex difference in the brain. The second is that hormones, um, hormones act prenatally and postnatally in, in a lot of species to cause permanent change. And the most obvious um, hormonally dependent sex difference that we're all familiar with is external genitals in humans and in other mammals, uh, testosterone from the testes of males causes the differentiation of penis and scrotum in, in the male. And in the absence of, of testosterone, of those higher levels of testosterone in the female, a clitoris and, and a vaginal labia differentiate in the female, um, controlled by other genes and other processes. Okay, so um, we can test that kind of thing. If, what happens if you take away these hormones in adulthood? And the experiment was, so we, I, I, in my PhD thesis, uh, um, castrated uh, adult male zebra finches, and they sing less. They still sing, but they don't sing as much as before. So their behavior, part of the sex difference in the amount of singing, is attributable to how much testicular hormones are around in adulthood. But the brain regions don't change much, okay? Um, whereas um, if you change hormones early in development, um, in these uh, permanent effects. So, so hormones act, permanent, act early in development to, as it were, set up the substrate on which hormones later act. This is a time-honored and well-documented phenomenon um, and is certainly true for a number of uh, reproductive tissues. So um, the, the second experiment, the, um, the permanent hormone effects, were discovered by Gurney and Kanishi at Caltech, but we repeated them in this study, Eric, Aaron Jacobs in my lab, and you can see, um, um, these are just the pictures of males and females repeated. Um, this is Aaron. And uh, this is the size of this one brain region in a male and in females. And then if you treat the female with um, a, uh, a testicular hormone um, early in life, on the day of hatching, and let her grow up, and then measure the brain region later on, she is much more masculine, and she actually sings. So, that was evidence that, in fact, the hormones were having an effect and that the males might be secreting a hormone that causes permanent masculinization of this brain structure. Now, that same kind of thing we found in other um, uh, parts of the central nervous system. Later on in our lab, once I got to UCLA, we studied a, a nucleus of, um, uh, in the rat's spinal cord. And this is a nucleus that males have about um, a, a couple hundred neurons in. Females don't have very many. They have, they have some, but um, not so many. And if you take a 
a male and take away his testosterone before birth. So he, he, he uh, doesn't, he's not influenced by his testosterone, then the spinal cord looks feminine. And if you give females testosterone, the spinal cord looks masculine. Now this nucleus is a group of neurons that innervate the penis. And there, there was a joke journal called the Journal of Irreproducible Results, and they picked up this story and they say that after years and years of study, Reed Love and Arnold have shown that males have more neurons innervating the penis than females do. And, um, which, which was true, but it was actually, um, uh, it's a nice place to study where, how uh, androgens in, in particular act to cause permanent uh, sex differences. The same thing was, was found in other brain regions too. So Roger Gorski at UCLA studied a group of neurons in the hypothalamus, same thing. If you treat the female early in life, pre or postnatally with testosterone, um, th this is the male structure and the female structure, and you can sex reverse this by giving or taking away the hormones in the same way, and the effects of the hor hormones are permanent. Herr de Vries, um, now at Georgia State University, studied the lateral septum in rodents. And here the male has more innervation with a group of neurons that, that contain vasopressin. And this area of the brain is involved in uh, paternal behavior and pair bonding, at least in bulls. And so this sex difference, um, again, is determined by the level of testosterone prenatally, postnatally. Um, if testosterone is there, the male form develops. If it's not, the female does. So all these <clears throat> studies uh, contributed to this general idea, which I call this 20th century central dogma, um, which is that all sex differences come from the sex chromosomes. In, in the one cell, we were all at one point a one cell beginning of a person when the sperm fertilized the egg. And we were either X, most of us either XX or XY, okay? All sex differences stem from these sex chromosomes because in that one cell creature, there are no other molecules that we know of that are uh, uh, different between males and females. On average, they're the same. Um, that genetic difference leads to the differentiation of gonads, um, either testes or ovaries. And then once that happens, then there's this lifelong pattern of different secretion of gonadal hormones for the rest of of the animal's life or for our lives. And, and all sex differences in non-gonadal tissues have, were ascribed in the 20th century model to um, these uh, gonadal hormones. But there's something else about this finding that was, so we can emphasize that the, ma the female here is masculinized by a hormone, a derivative of a, of a testicular hormone. But the other thing is that the female actually isn't fully masculine here. Uh, we could also emphasize you know, that the glass is half full that, that there was nothing we could do over a long period of time to make the female completely masculine by changing her hormones. So we thought there might be something else. Um, a, um, by an incredible stroke of luck, a, a, a single bird fell into our lap, okay? But actually, it was, a, um, it was a gift from Fernando Nottebaum at Rockefeller, and he found this bird in his colony in, in Dutchess County, Dutchess County, New York. And it is uh, what's popularly known as a half cider. Um, and the scientific term is a gynandromorph. So it's, it's both uh, you know, gynecological and andro. It's a combination of female and uh, male tissues, in fact. So here's a picture of the bird. Actually, all three of these are the same picture of the, of, of the bird from different views. On the right side of the animal, the animal has male plumage, male feathers. He's got the attractive brown cheek patch, the zebra stripes on the breast, the black bar. On the left side of the animal, it, it has female plumage. And you can see that the dividing line is straight down the middle. Okay, it's an incredible, and these birds happen with the, uh, consistently, but very rarely in the, in the bird world. Okay, um, on this side of the, of the animal, there's a testis, um, and on this side of the animal, there's an ovary. And so, genetically, the animal is genetically male on one side and genetically female on the other side. So, any you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking to know that that this sex difference in the plumage probably is not due to hormones. Because whatever the hormones, it's a mixture of testicular and ovarian hormones, these hormones are going all over the body. And yet, one side of the animal is, the traits are male and the other side are female. And of course, what we really want to know is what's going on in the brain. So if, if gonadal hormones act on both sides, and, um, then you would expect that, the, if, especially if it's testicular hormones that are doing it, you'd expect both sides, because the animal has a testis on one side, both sides might be masculine. But if instead, what's the alternative? Well, 
an alternative is it's actually the sex chromosomes within the cells themselves. It's not something coming from the gonads to the brain, but the brain itself has a uh, inherent code that tends to make it more or less masculine or feminine. And so the male sex chromosomes are on one side, the female sex chromosomes are on the other side. Um, what's the answer? Um, well, um, if that's, you know, the prediction would be that one side would be masculine and the other side feminine. In fact, it was actually somewhat in between, but we did find that the male side of the brain was more masculine than the female side. That is, the genetically male side of the brain was more masculine um, than, um, th than the genetically female side of the brain. Um, <coughs> so this led us to the idea that, in fact, the sex chromosomes might be um, doing something important. So we turned to a mouse, to, to mice, where we could actually manipulate um, things much, um, much more clearly. And uh, we picked up a mouse model from Paul Burgoyne and Robin Lovell Badge at the, at the National Institute for Medical Research in London, uh, a model they had developed. And this animal essentially has four sexes. It has XX and XY animals with testes, and it has XX and XY animals with ovaries. It's a genetic trick. Um, I'm not gonna, I don't really have time to go into how it's done, but this is just a hopefully evocative drawing to show that the animal can either be XX or XY. It's a two by two um, experiment. The animal's either XX or XY, and they either have testes or they have ovaries, and you get four sexes, which are different combinations of sex chromosomes and gonadal hormones. And so the question is, well, if we compare, for example, a female, that is the XX, that is a gonadal female, both of these animals have ovaries, an animal with ovaries that is XX, an animal with ovaries that is XY, is that animal, are those two animals different? By the hormonal theory, they shouldn't be different at all. But we found, in fact, in a number of things, that they are different. For example, in body weight, um, if you weigh, so there's four sexes here, the pink um, is, you know, surprisingly female, the blue is surprisingly male here, and, and by male and female we mean ovaries and testes, okay? Um, so um, if you measure the body weight, so male mice are bigger, heavier in, uh, than female mice in adulthood, um, and it, after the animals pass through puberty, the t animals that have testes are heavier than the animals with ovaries. So that looks like a hormone effect. And in fact, if you take out the gonads, that goes away. In fact, if you wait a number of months after you take out the gonads, then in fact, both XX groups are heavier than both XY groups, and they're, it, they're heavier because they have a lot more body fat. So here we have a sex chromosome effect on the amount of body fat, and we're, we're working to find the X, gene, the X genes that do it. It has to do with the number of X chromosomes, not um, whether the animal has a Y chromosome or not. Um, um, so in, th these studies are in collaboration with Karen Rui at UCLA. This is a, a collaboration with Matsur Egbali at UCLA who studies heart disease. Basically, you can take a heart, uh, you anesthetize the mouse and take the heart out and hook it up to a chamber. The heart keeps on beating and you can give it a, a, a kind of a heart attack in the, in, in the chamber and see how well the heart that has removed the oxygen for a while and then give it, give it back and see how the heart recovers. And in fact, the XX hearts, this is the infarct size, how, how much of the heart is destroyed in this heart attack. And the XX hearts do uh, uh, more poorly than the XY hearts, independent of whether they used to have, um, uh, uh, whether they had, uh, uh, used to have uh, testes or ovaries. These animals are gonadectomized, so the hormones have been removed. Uh, this is a study by Rhonda Vosco uh, at UCLA, and, and I won't go into it just to say that if you, give a mouse um, as something like multiple sclerosis, that if the mouse has XY brain cells, it does worse than if it has XX brain cells. So in this case, it goes in the opposite direction. So the sex chromosomes do uh, play a role. And so if we come out at the end here and say, okay, what are the factors, what are the biological factors that make males and females different? We have the old 20th century dogma. For sure, gonadal hormones are important. I think they're the most important thing. There's no change in that. But in, in addition, we add a, another set of factors coming from the sex chromosomes. And at this point in research, we actually don't know what it is, what are the genes, and that's exactly what we're, what we're trying to do, find them. Um, in, we've tried to see, okay, what's the relative weight, and which, um, and, and we could do that in a gene expression experiment, and here's some pie charts 
There are three colors in the pie chart. The dark blue are the activation effects. So what, how many sex differences go away if you take out the gonads in adulthood? And the largest part of the pie in the liver or the brain, the largest part of the pie are sex differences that go away if you take out the gonads of adult mice. Uh, so they're activation, what we call activational effect. The second biggest part of the pie are these long-term effects of early hormones. The number of genes changed by um, whether the animal has ovaries or testes over the long term. And the third part, the smaller part, are sex chromosome effects, what, what genes change in response to having XX or XY. So um, that's kind of the, the, um, the setup here is that, that we, in our lab, we talk about the big three, activational effects, permanent hormo uh, organizational effects, and sex chromosome effects. And we're interested in how all these things interact in animals um, to make uh, sex differences. Thanks very much. as to whether, um, whether you see this as being the kind of the foundation for understanding sex differences in humans, or do you think that uh, understanding animal sex differences on its own is intrinsically interesting, but are you interested in taking it that extra step and looking at sex differences in humans? And if so, um, how relevant are your studies, I and mean, how can you sort of compare them? So, um, I personally am not taking that step. I, I've got my hands full, um, just barely understanding how these things work in mice uh, currently, um, and that's already a full-time, more than a full-time job. So, um, I'm not gonna take it into humans. Um, I, I, I don't think there's anywhere else we can find out the questions to ask about humans, except by studying animals, okay? Um, you know, when you go to the doctor and you are treated for some disease, the framework in, by which the doctor is thinking about the disease has come quite significantly from animal research, okay? Um, the, like our conceptual framework here did not come from studying humans, it came from studying animals. This dogma that it's gonna be organizational or activational, et cetera, this comes from analysis of animals. So, the animals are incredibly useful for coming up with ideas that we can then try to test in humans. And, um, and it, of course, we're gonna find out within a couple minutes that it's gonna get complicated when we take this, these, um, this information into humans. But as I said, you know, evolution didn't stop when it got to humans. All the same hormones and receptor systems and many of the same genes are present in our bodies as in the animals that we study. So I think there is a significant link. Do you think that uh, the interesting thing about birds, for example, is birds actually, in some ways, are considered a better model for, for human social behavior than, say, rodents? Do you agree with that? Because they, they actually do form pairs, raise their young in families, surrounded by in-laws and everybody else. Um, do, you, do you see that sort of bird research has something worth pursuing in that regard? Well, I can state that in my own uh, case, I got more um, novel ideas from studying birds than I did from studying uh, mammals. However, um, I think any phenomenon in nature has some animal um, system in which it can best be studied. And sometimes that's birds, sometimes it's mammals. There's an overwhelming emphasis on the study of mammals in animal research because we are more closely related to mice than we are to uh, songbirds. So the amount of money spent is huge on mice relative to, to songbirds. But there are some things that songbirds do, as you say. Um, it, it might be social behavior, you know, the learned vocalizations of, of these birds uh, parallel human vocal learning in ways that you don't see in mice and you can't study in mice. So there, there, are times, there are times when studying a cricket is more interesting and important than a mouse if it's reflecting a process that, um, that happens in, in, uh, in humans. Uh, one final question. You, you've collaborated with Geert de Vries and looked at um, 
whether or not some of the sex differences that you do see in brains actually serve to kind of bring behavior back to similarity. You know, this idea that somehow some of these differences are not really, the end product is not a difference, but the same kind of behavior, male and female. Yeah, so I didn't have time today to talk about if you have, so our evolving ideas, our developing ideas about sex differences are that it's not just one thing anymore. It's not just having testosterone versus estradiol. That's, it's not that simple. That there are hormones and there are sex chromosomes and because they are acting independently, that sometimes they, you know, if you have, let's say, a Y chromosome, it might make you more masculine, but sometimes they actually counteract each other and cancel each other out. We know, for example, um, uh, that there's a process called X inactivation. Only females do this process. It is a quintessentially feminine molecular event. One X chromosome in every female cell is shut off. Um, so that's, if, is that a sex difference? It sure is. Um, because if a male shut off his X chromosome, he'd die, he'd be dead, he would never be born. So um, that's something that females do. It is a sex difference, but actually it makes the females much more like males than they otherwise would be because now she's got one X chromosome and he's got one X chromosome. And that X chromosome in both of those cells can interact with the 95% of the rest of the genome in about the same doses. So, um, yeah, I didn't have time to develop that. Okay, great. Well, I, I want to say that we're going to have questions from the audience at the end. So if you have anything burning you want to ask, keep it in mind. Thank you. That was a great talk. Yeah. This is Dr. Ray Silver, yes. and she's going to be continuing on the basic biology of sex differences. Thanks. Hi. So my name is Ray Silver, and as you heard, I'm a professor here at Barnard. Um, I have on this slide my two mentors. Uh, the first, Donald Hebb, um, was the presented the original theory of plasticity in the brain called Hebbian plasticity or Hebbian circuits. And the second is Daniel Lehrman, who died quite young, very unfortunately. And the reason I put them up here is because they set the framework for my thinking through my academic career. How, how is it that we can learn? What changes when we learn? What is plasticity? And in the nature-nurture debate, the debate is always out there. What's changed, the question is the same. My mother would say, how come you're still studying nature and nurture? Well, the questions around nature and nurture have, are still out there to be answered. What changes is the sophistication and the detail with which we can address those questions. So let me tell you something about my background um, in a New York Minute. I grew up in Montreal in Canada. I attended the local university, which is McGill University. All my friends went there, I went there. There was never a question. Um, I met my boyfriend and um, he came to New York to be in graduate school here in physics in Columbia. So I lived right here in the neighborhood. And when I, he lived in the neighborhood. And when I graduated from college, I followed him to New York. Um, found out that I, you can't just walk in and be here. You have to have a visa and papers and all that. So um, I found out the only way I could get a visa and papers was to go to school. So I looked at the subway line, looked at all the colleges, went to school. And got married, had children. And my son was born in August 1976. That's relevant because I started at Barnard in September of 1976. That was the pre-pregnancy uh, leave era. Um, being, a, uh, being at Barnard was really fantastic. I had been uh, teaching at Rutgers in the night school before that in Newark, New Jersey. That was not an easy job. I also taught at Hunter College 
um, that, at three different buildings all around the city with a lab at the American Museum of Natural History. That was not an easy job. I quit both those jobs because I still wasn't really an academic. I just needed my visa. Um, then I came to Barnard. I lived just down the street, came to Barnard and thought I fell into some sort of school heaven. The students were great. There were great colleagues, great opportunities to do things. And um, in the course of being here at Barnard, I had lots of really exciting kinds of jobs. I served one year as a senior advisor in the office of the NSF director. I, was on a, I chaired a panel. I was on a panel at the Institute of Medicine. I'm going to tell you a bit of that. One of the really weird things I was able to do was to uh, chair a panel prioritizing research, biological research for the for NASA, for the International Space Station, and just to uh, top it off, before John Stewart discovered that politics is really funny, he used to do science, he thought science was funny, and um, I helped him walk through the ethics of animating mannequins. So there are a lot of opportunities being at Barnard and in New York. Um, as you know, I'm a professor here, and um, it is special being at Barnard. What's special about it is not only the opportunities at and around Barnard and the city, but also the students are great. It's fun and it's easy work. <laughs> so in 76, when I got my degree and started here and had my son was born, I started studying, not surprisingly, parental behavior. And as you heard, birds are an interesting model for some things. Uh, first of all, 92% of birds are monogamous, and they're also biparental. And in the birds that I was studying, these ring doves, which were the subjects of Blairman's research, ring doves, both the male and the female, take care of their young. They build their nest together, they sit on their eggs together, and they feed their young together. So they're biparental in every aspect of caring for the young, which I thought was a good model for my husband and me, except he worked far away. I worked right here. So we had a hard time being perfectly biparental. Um, what astounded me about the biparental behavior of the ring doves is that they have completely different mechanisms for doing it. And this took about five years to figure out, so I can't tell you all about it. But the bottom line was that the female, in sitting on the eggs and caring for the young, responds, requires the ovarian hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And there's a sequence of changes in these hormones. And when that sequence occurs, she takes care of eggs and young, whether they're her own or not. The male, on the other hand, will take care of the eggs and young when he sees his mate doing it. So it has to be his mate, it can't be a strange female. So she responds to her ovarian hormones, he responds to her. And so the principle that we've already alluded to in Art Arnold's talk is that there are neural and hormonal sex differences and they serve to promote similar behavior. Now at the time I was doing this research, I couldn't figure out how to study what it was about the male seeing his partner that made him parental. It was an intractable problem at that time. By the way, Rebecca Khaleesi, who just started here, who introduced this session, is now able to start studying that, and that's part of her work. The other thing that was really weird about these, um, all doves and pigeons, is that when they take care of their young, they share each day. The female sits from four o'clock until 10 the next morning, and the male sits from about 10 o'clock to four o'clock. So they split the daylight hours. And this is a hormonally dependent behavior. That is, you can get, if you give them the wrong hormones, give the male female typical hormones and the female male typical hormones, they'll switch the time that they sit. So their timing is different. And this too, although it was really an interesting problem, was intractable. I knew that it had to be an effect of hormones on the brain, but I couldn't, because of all the unknowns about the bird brain at that time, I couldn't study how timing could be different in male and female. 
how the hormones could be affecting your sense of time was completely intractable at that time. So I turned instead to mammalian systems. And in mammals, uh, evidence had appeared in 1972 that there's a brain clock. It sits about here, oops, here in your own brain. And it tells you when to wake up, when to go to sleep. It's a thing that helps you have jet lag when you do long distance traveling. And it's there in all mammalian systems, and we know where it is. And the research that I did when um, I was stuck at home taking care of my kids and I couldn't go anywhere on sabbatical was at the time very wild. Uh, we looked at, can you transplant this clock if it's really a brain clock? And this is when we thought it was a brain clock, but we're looking for the most definite kind of proof. If it's really a clock, we should be able to transplant it from one animal to the other. And the procedure involves taking a small piece of brain tissue and implanting it into the ventricle, the fluid-filled space in the brain um, of an animal who doesn't have his own clock, and seeing what happens to the function of the clock. So if I gave you my clock, my watch, for example, and I'm always a little bit late wherever I go, if you are using my watch to decide where to go when, you would always be a little late. If you had your own watch, you would do whatever you normally do, which might be be early, be late, whatever. So this transplant procedure is very definitive because you can transplant a behavioral property from one animal to another. And uh, depicted here is the way this research is usually shown. You have serial days, one, two, three, four, five, etc., and time of day across here. And the clock, when it's sitting inside the brain, get started, the animal, these black bars indicate activity, and the animal is active a little bit later, day after day. That's when his own clock is running. When he loses his clock and you transplant a donor clock, you can use a donor that has a different period, a, a clock that runs fast, so that now instead of getting up later each day, he starts getting up earlier each day. So the property of the clock is actually transplanted by transplanting this little piece of tissue. And one of the really cool studies that we did after that was to put that little piece of tissue into a polymer capsule that allowed chemicals to diffuse out, like a little bouquet garni that you might use in soup. It allowed chemicals to diffuse out, but it didn't allow fibers to grow out. And that, too, was able to restore function. So that proves there's some sort of diffusible chemical that leaves this brain tissue that influences timing behavior. So these were all really exciting kinds of studies that one could do in animals. Well, what, what about hormones? An amazing thing about hormones is that this is a photomicrograph, so it's a brain section that's stained for various peptides. And it turns out that uh, this part that's stained green using antibodies is the location of androgen receptors in the brain clock. So this is the ventricle, that's one side, the clock on one side and the clock on the other side. The androgen receptors lie here in the middle area and the estrogen receptors lie there all around the androgen receptor area. If you castrate the animal, the androgen receptors disappear. And not only are the receptors of the clock different in the two sexes, but the input from other brain areas to the two parts of the clock are different in male and female. So these are the pink, necessarily, are areas that communicate um, to the clock in the female and the blue are areas that communicate to the clock in the male. What relevance has this? Well, in humans, I don't know that this is the mechanism, but we know that in, hum in people, the, um, there are sex differences in the timing of going to sleep. So females at all ages go to sleep earlier than males do. This is especially different in the early 20s, but it continues into old age when both reach adrenarchy and um, menarche, and the, that's when the sex difference disappears. So 
though we don't know the mechanism, we're not surprised that there's a sex difference in humans as well, given that this kind of timing difference is hormonally based and different in animal studies, including mammals, that have, many mammals that have been studied. So there are differences, so to speak, in the ticking of the brain clock. Well, at some point I always ask myself, well, why do I care? Why do I care? Why am I doing research of this kind? Um, first, when I talk about sex differences, I'm, I'm really speaking in the same way that Art Arnold did. I'm thinking of sex as a the biological construct, and I'm thinking of the genetic, hormonal, and metabolic factors. I'm not at all thinking about gender role, or the, what society tells us are male and female typical, and I'm not at all thinking about gender identity, how we express our own experiences of our sexuality, because none of this research speaks to that. And gender role and gender identity are not topics that can be addressed by um, in mechanistic studies derived from animal research, and today we don't have mechanisms for looking at it very carefully in humans at all. So why do I care about sex differences? Well, I really care because there are so many sex differences in disease states, and I want to know why that happens. It must be the case that in one, se in one sex there are some protective mechanisms, and in the other sex there must may be mechanisms of susceptibility. We need to know what is protective and where is susceptibility. And among the diseases in which this occurs are several that are, disease, that are neurological or behavioral. And I've just color-coded them here in a slide that are Arnold lent me. Um, Alzheimer's, ALS, anorexia nervosa, and again, of course, the red are the ones where the females are more frequently found and um, the blue are the ones where males are more frequently seen. And some of them are really quite dramatic, like sleep apnea, gender identity disorders, anorexia nervosa. So there are many, and there are many other diseases which are not neurologically based that are also different in the two sexes in the incidence. So we want to know why. Well, what do we know about the causes? of sex differences in the brain. I put this, let me count the ways, because there's so many causes that we already know about. It's an old and endless and classic question, and it's still, it's still a frontier of research. And what we see from research is increasingly sophisticated kinds of answers. So one way to look at sex differences is to look at gene expression. It's, it's relatively easy to look at gene expression in a tissue like the liver because every liver cell is like every other liver cell. And we see, if we look at liver, that 72% um, <coughs> of mRNAs are sex biased with 28% where male and female are identical and 68% where they're different in the sexes. Um, these differences also occur, are seen and reported in the brain. Uh, serotonin synthesis rates in healthy men and women using PET emission, positive emission tomography suggest that the rate of synthesis is higher, 52% higher in males than in females. And as you know, as, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are typically used as antidepressants in the treatment of depression. And it may be that the difference in the, the different bias in the sexes may be due to some sort of metabolic factor, such as suggested in this study. Steroid hormones, um, in, in the the original literature, we thought that steroid hormones only, act on ge only acted on genes. But we know today that not only are there direct genomic effects, there are also indirect <coughs> effects that are not based on genomes. There are nuclear receptors, there are membrane receptors, there are signaling pathways that can be slow or, slow or fast, and there are actions on synapses. So the steroid hormones that come from the ovary and testis can affect all of these different factors within individual cells. And if you think, and cells are, have the same properties in evolution. That is, if you looked at a cell in a rat and a cell in a, a, 
any other mammal, you probably find the same sorts of mechanisms occurring. Since not every system has been studied everywhere, I won't make that definitive, but I'm pretty sure that that's definitive, that these different aspects of hormone action occur throughout mammalian systems in, in brain cells. Um, one of the most dramatic and, to me, surprising recent findings is I knew the brain was plastic, but I didn't know that remodeling of dendrites in neurons could occur very quickly. So this is a slide taken from work with Paul Pave in Strasbourg, and he studies hibernating animals. And he showed that these changes in the dendritic arbors of neurons can occur within a matter of hours. So the brain is plastic, and individual cells respond really quickly to changes in state. Um, to bring this back to sex differences, females and males, res res the neurons of female and male rats have been shown to change differently in response to stress. So in males, stress causes dendrites connected to other, stress causes shrinkage in dendrites that are connected to uh, cells in the cortex. But in females, the dendrites do not shrink. The neurons that communicate with other parts of the brain respond to stress by expanding. For stress to do this, females, females have to have the hormone estrogen in their systems. Ovariectomized females that don't have estrogens do not show this response. So not only is resting state different, but response to external stimuli results in different reactions in male and female neurons. So you can see that we're getting fairly sophisticated in analyzing what goes on at the cellular level in response to hormones that are derived from the ovary and the testis. OK, where else, where else in the brain do these occur? Well, given the ubiquity of cells that respond to estrogens and androgens, we don't know. They're pro we don't have a complete picture by far. But um, let me move on. We don't have a complete picture, and these stories are the beginning of what we can learn. Hormone actions will co-opt and participate. Hormone actions co-opt and participate in many mechanisms, from the epigenome to rapid signaling, and they participate in many aspects of adaptive plasticity. Structural plasticity is common, and it's reversible up to a point. Perhaps in older age, the plasticity is diminished. Sex differences in brain structure and function occur, and they're likely to be very widespread through the nervous system. And the hormones from ovaries and testes are very much involved in remodeling of synaptic connections. The basic neuroscience research that I've tried to describe here doesn't point to a male brain or a female brain, but it establishes the principle that there's a highly heterogeneous brain with many different cells that respond in unique ways depending on conditions, both hormonal conditions and environmental and experiential conditions. Given that this is true, and given that what we want to figure out is how to, how to improve treatment and disease, how can we make use of this knowledge properly and optimally? Um, one of the things that I was involved in was this Institute of Medicine panel that tried to um, bring together the different stakeholders who are involved in doing research and supporting research. These include the National Institute of Health, the Federal Drug Administration, the pharmaceutical indus industry, patient advocacy groups, scientific journals, the general press, and basic and clinical researchers. They all came to the table to express their points of view about whether they were interested or not interested in furthering our understanding of sex differences. Because of the disease states, we felt that it was an important question to pursue. Okay. The panel members addressed several kinds of questions. First, 
when and how can we study sex differences? There's so many things that can be studied, it's difficult to figure out where to start. Should we look at anatomy, physiology, incidence and age of disease onset, symptoms impacting disease? It's really such a, a broad problem set. Where do you start and where do you put your priorities? What are the next, another kind of question that the panel addressed was, what are the challenges in order to, that we face in order to make progress in sex difference research, given the different interests of the different stakeholders, the broad scope of the problem, the scope of the problem, and uh, the cost involved? Well, the challenges involve things like clinical trials, getting sex difference research done and reported. It's very hard to power clinical trials to have both sexes represented. Um, many, in terms of basic researchers, many researchers don't, are not aware of the pervasiveness of sex differences. In many journals, it's not even reported whether a male or female was used as a subject in the study. Um, I'm going to skip through the rest of this. The report is available online for anyone who's interested in looking at it. And of course, there's, there are barriers to doing this kind of research. Some of the barriers include the fact that we don't really want to know that there are sex differences. I, want, I don't want to hear that the male brain is different from the female brain. I don't want to hear that the serotonin is metabolized differently because I don't want it used against me. So we sort of have to take Gandhi's principle that we not only need to do good research, but we also have to have humanity and wisdom in looking at it. So those are among the barriers to doing research. Um, nevertheless, looking forward to new developments, we have had an impact. These different stakeholders have come together successfully. So um, NIH, had the F um, with regard to dosing, I'm sure some of you noticed that um, for some of the sleep medications, it's now advised that women use a different dose than men because it's recognized that they, the sleep medication, Zolopram, has different effects in men and women. Um, and um, big pharma, the big pharmaceutical companies, had previously been interested only in doing uh, selling big blockbuster drugs on which they could make huge amounts of money from a single uh, kind of drug. Given the fact that we've learned so much through the Human Genome Project and the fact that medicine is becoming much more personalized these days, the sex difference part of it is one aspect of the personalization of medicine. The big pharma companies are now recognizing that they have to target their drugs to specific markets, that is to individuals who will most benefit from it. So at the frontiers of research and at the frontiers of drug development, things are changing rather rapidly. And just to end up, when I started in neuroscience, there were very few women in neuroscience and it was a tough slog. Here at Barton today and in schools across the country, there are many women entering the field of neuroscience, and for sure, we're going to be represented at the table and impacting the kinds of changes that we see in the studies. So it will no longer be bad or misusable to find an, an effect of, a, of a, an ovarian or a testicular hormone. It will just be part of the mechanism that enables us to function together whether we use the same or different underlying mechanisms. The research by itself has no consequences for how it's used. How it's used is a separate judgment. And having women at the table will enable keeping that clearly in mind. Thank you. That was a great talk. Um, I'm wondering if you might even just speculate a little bit on some of the differences that we do see in disease incidents, for example, autism, four times more common in males than females, or uh, attention deficit disorder. Where do we stand on understanding these things, which are so extreme? 
you know, I, I know that we don't know. I also know that we're desperate to find out for autism, for example. Autism, autism is especially scary because um, it's so devastating and attacks so young, but first, autism is many, many different diseases. And part of the reason the incidence is higher in males is because um, it, in some males, in many cases in males, there are a variety of other genetic abnormalities like cleft palate or, um, you know, I can't remember them, but uh, I did attend a conference where it was so painful to listen to the parents of autistic children that I could barely stand hearing the research. We don't know. That, the fact is we don't know. I, I don't want to speculate. Um, the, the best kind of idea that we have is that in the course of development, so at some stage, the neural pathways don't make their usual connections, but make different connections. And why does that happen is something we don't know. And with the rise of personalized medicine, do you think that knowing the differences, sexual differences, is, is going to become less relevant in terms of the treatment protocols? I, I absolutely do. So I will, I absolutely do believe it. So going on the principle, if we look at breast cancers, knowing that the, um, if you know the probability that there's a mutation, if you, if you can detect the mutation in BRCA1 and BRCA2, you know that the probability of getting cancer is higher. If you have one of the genes associated with a very aggressive cancer, like the HN, I think it's called HN, you know that you have to have very aggressive treatment. So there's no question that the treatment of uh, these diseases has changed once we know the susceptibility of the individual. If you have a steroid positive can breast cancer, then you know that removal of steroid hormones is going to diminish the probability that subsequent cancer will develop following treatment. So taking that as a very strong model, I have to say yes, personalized medicine will work. And, uh are you continuing to work at all on, on ring doves? Because I find it amazing that the males would actually change their behavior based on whether or not they see their mate. Um, and is this applicable to us? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, with, the emerge, with the developments of the Human Genome Project, researchers in the United States were highly pressured to work with genetic animals. Ring doves were not genetic animals. So the, the statistics for getting funded for doing research on a non-genetic animal was very poor. And that forced me to switch to something where I could do my work. I have to point out that this was not the case in Europe. So in Europe, they did not think that we should suddenly abandon the best models for what we wanted to study just because we knew something about the genes. And in Europe, there's, uh, there are a lot more studies being done on insects and mammals and birds of whatever kind are the best example of the phenomenon that you want to study. We don't have that strategy. We lost that strategy with the genome. Thank you very much, and again, we'll have some more questions after you. Uh, Rebecca Jordan Young will talk now. Brainstorm. Sorry, is there a tech person here? I need to have my presenter format of this, not just the slides, thanks. And 
I'm not a PC person anymore. <laughs> Take that as you, as you wish. <laughs> Okay, hey, well, hello. It's a real honor to be here tonight and to have such a nice crowd. Thank you so much for this. I am not actually going to talk so much about the flaws in the science of sex difference per se tonight. I'm gonna to talk about um, ways in which we can move our thinking forward so that we can really find points of productive agreement and pro productive experimentation that will move us away from a lot of the um, both sloppy public conversation that often happens around this. And unfortunately, the reciprocal effects of that go, you know, they circulate back into and, and back out from some science. And I want to plea a little bit for thinking about how um, when we're doing our scientific work and sometimes feel like we're just talking to other scientific insiders and there's you know, acceptable kinds of shorthand, there are costs to the kinds of simplifications and the kinds of language choices that get made. And I think that um, more than you might expect, some of the simplifications that, that scientists know better than doing show up a lot of times in scientific journals too. And so uh, I'm gonna talk I'm not gonna talk any more about that, but I'm gonna just say that, that I wanna focus tonight on humans, and I'm gonna be focusing primarily on outcomes, and I'll describe what is it that I'm talking about with that, so. Um, no, that's not doing anything, here we go. I just wanna do a shout out to my collaborators because they, um, uh, I've had this group of people, Cordelia Fine, Annalise Kaiser, Gina Rapon, also Kristen Springer, Jean Mager Stellman, um, were very instrumental in working with me around most of the ideas I'll present tonight. And I also want to uh, just note that the Tao Family Foundation has made it possible for me to do work like this, which is this kind of synthetic theoretical review article is not something that is really easy to fund doing, you know, you need very general research support to do things like this. So I want to thank the Tao Family Foundation for making some of that possible. The, the main gist of my talk tonight is based on one of those two articles that I just showed you. This is, um, this is my little pointer, where's the little red thing? Is this, it? here it is. This is a new article that just came out this fall, Recommendations for Sex, Gender, Neuroimaging Research key principles um, and implications for design analysis and interpretation. This was in Frontiers in Human Neuroscience. And this article, in many ways, takes a model that, that we created up here. And I think it's important to note, because there's a way in which it builds right on the IOM report and really kind of responded to the IOM work that Ray was just now talking about. Our concern was that, on the one hand, all of us were people who had been very involved in and interested in promoting attention to sex and gender as important variables in human health. And in particular, we were concerned about the ways in which um, uh, blanket bans of women from clinical trials, for example, had created a lot of problems. So we, we really knew that there had to be changes. We wanted there to be changes. But then there were lots of us who were not so happy with precisely what solutions were uh, put forward in the IOM report. And in particular, one of the things that we saw problematic was that there was not just a mandate to study sex and gender, but that there was a, an explicit 
prioritization of studying difference instead of studying also and documenting similarities. Now, one of the reasons that that's a problem, you've heard from a couple of speakers tonight that differences at one point along a developmental pathway or differences in structure um, don't necessarily predict differences at a different point in the pathway or differences in function. So it's really, really important that we not think that um, always looking at difference is gonna be the thing that's gonna be the most informative. We have to actually think quite carefully and specifically about um, what are the shape of the comparisons we're interested in. And I'll come back to what I mean by that in a little bit. So the four principles that we came up with to describe what you really need to know in order to do good work in human neuroscience right now. What are the, the ways in which um, uh, you would have to take into account the existing data on human sex comparisons? Based on the, the earlier piece that beyond a catalog of differences, we don't really think it's productive to just keep on generating a growing list of differences. And there, there are lots of reasons for that, in part because we're already working uh, within a scientific convention where there's a strong publication bias towards um, publishing findings of difference. It's really hard to find, they're, they're considered negative findings. If you do group comparisons and you don't see a difference between males and females, it's hard to get that out there. On the other hand, even if what you're looking at is not sex per se, if you analyze your data and you find a sex difference, you get a little bonus publication out of that. You can always um, make a good case. If you have a well-designed study, it's quite easy to get those things in the literature. The problem is there's this thing called the file drawer problem, and we don't have a background against which to measure um, how many times people were looking for certain things across a whole research network or across a whole large set of variables and all the different studies. Um, when we see the big list of differences, what was the whole pool um, that also found similarities that didn't get published. Now, there's a great piece that I'm gonna be drawing on tonight by uh, Janet Hyde, uh, who's a psychologist in uh, Wisconsin, and she has put forward the gender similarities hypothesis. A lot of the work that I'm talking about here owes a great debt to Janet Hyde. From that um, piece beyond a catalog of differences, we had two basic arguments. One was that sex itself is not a biological mechanism. If we want to understand mechanisms, we must get much more specific about what we mean by sex in particular contexts. Another, um, a, a, another principle in that is that sex and gender are entangled. Again, I'm talking strictly about humans tonight, and um, I will try to describe and, and demonstrate to you what I mean by entanglement. But the point is that analyses need to proceed by assuming that measures of sex are not pristine. We're not capturing some pure biology in almost all cases where we're looking at sex and brain and behavior. But we're looking at outcomes that already include the effects of gendered social environments. So, just again, uh, just one more grounding thing, which is that before we look for explanations of why things are as they are, we have to make sure that we have a good description of the phenomenon we're trying to explain. Overlap, mosaicism, and contingency describe aspects of the human brain or behavior phenotype. That is, they answer questions like, what is the shape of sex or gender in the human brain? Um, in terms of uh, similarities and differences. What does sex gender look like in the brain? Where do you see it? Or how are features distributed by sex gender? And then entanglement is the concept that's important for thinking about how biology and the environment are related from early development throughout the lifespan. So what is the best way to think about how females and, uh, and males, to think about females and males in terms of how groups compare to each other? How do we think about similarity and difference? 
the data that we have in human brains and in human behavior and personality types and traits and so on suggests that the most important principle to recognize is overlap. So there are lots of ways to visualize overlap. Um, and I'm going to start here with an example that actually comes from the not brain and behavior, but from the other beyond a catalog of differences, because I think it's a really useful um, demonstration. Now notice here, this is looking at arterial elasticity is an important risk factor for heart disease. Basically, if your arteries are stiffer, um, you know, you've heard it, hardening of the arteries, it's a bad thing. We, we tend to think of that. And there is an effect of, of sex. And here you see these two lines. These are the um, large arteries, and these are small <coughs> arteries. And this measure of elasticity, um, if you see this little, this more uh, light line down here is female. This darker line up here is male for the large arteries. And down here, you have a very similar pattern for the small ones. So you see. This is the, these are the female measures, these are the male measures. That tells you there's some kind of a sex difference going on here in both large and small. But what else you see is this is measuring elasticity as it correlates with height. And the curves are almost identical for both kinds of arteries. The very interesting thing is that there is, there is indeed a sex difference, but if you control for height, that sex difference completely goes away. The most important factor here is height. Now, if I am a cardiologist and I have a drug that has something to do with arterial elasticity, it's more important for me to, to just simply know how tall my patient is. And the sex-specific medicine thing here, there's a problem, which I'm going to show you in a moment, which is misclassification of patients under the treatment. If I split my treatment as a male treatment and a female treatment, and what we have is a phenomenon of significant overlap, then we have a real problem when it comes to a dichotomous treatment, because many people would get the wrong one based on this variable sex. So in, uh, in psychological traits, um, typical uh, overlaps, this is very typical. Most of the variables that Janet Hyde looked at, and she's done many, many, she's done the most uh, aggregate meta-analyses of human psychological traits and behaviors. And this is, uh, I think, that about 40% of traits that are found to have any sex difference at all have uh, an overlap that looks like about like this. This particular data is on a self-esteem meta-analysis. So self-esteem is something that's been reliably found to differ. But as you see, it's quite small. So this is an effect size. The effect size D is the statistic that's used. And it just shows you that when you have very large groups, you can indeed reliably see a difference but that most people's values fall in the same curve, whether they're male or female. That's just a second way of showing overlap. There, graphically, as I said, you could do it lots of ways. So one really important question, I think, uh, is when is it right to use the term dimorphic, or male type or female type, for a variable that's overlapping? Is it ever correct? And how far apart would these curves have to move before we would call it dimorphic? Here, the thing is that we're not talking about um, something like a uterus that is present in females and is not present in males, or vas deferens, which is a structure present in the male reproductive system that's not present in the female reproductive system. In brains and behaviors, we're really talking about continuous variables, even frankly in terms of different nuclei that might have a male form or female form, that distinction is based on size. And there's nothing in humans that approaches the kind of size differences um, that we've seen in, in other animals. There will be uh, the, the SDN, that, that clock is probably the closest uh, I think that that's been found. Um, so what are the consequences for treating the variable as dimorphic? Let's take a look. Daphne, I borrowed a slide from you. Um, <laughs> this is um, the, uh, the, this is the representation of male and female data for one particular brain structure that came from a study that, that aggregated many, many, many different uh, people and many different brain structures, and they did, in fact, find an average sex difference here. That's 
one reason why this structure showed up in Daphne's meta-analysis. What I've done is added a line here to just show you a, a, uh, one possible place that you could choose if you needed to make this dimorphic and say that, okay, the green is the male and the red is the female. So if you had to choose a place to make it dimorphic, you have these modal peaks here. So maybe everything to the left of this value would be the male form, everything to the right of this value would be the female form. But then what happens, um, if you think about, that means that all of these people in here, right, are actually females that have the male form. You can, you know, eyeball it, that's roughly a third, maybe more than a third of the females in the sample. And likewise, you have, I'd say, well over a third of the males who have the so-called female form. So here, if we're talking about something that's a phenomenon that you're going to treat in some way, you have very severe misclassification of a significant proportion of the people in the sample. So it's really important to think about how do we conceptualize our variables and, to, and that that choice should be linked to what it is we're going to do with those variables. What are we going to do with that difference? Okay, so are women and men the same or are they different? Well, the answer is obvious, yes. <laughs> so focusing only on similarities or on differences is misleading. We need to look at distributions. We need to look at overlap, variance. Uh, I wish I had um, Ray's wonderful uh, curve of the clock because one of the things about that was to notice that the male and female, the shape of the curves was actually different. So all of those things are, are interesting and, and worth knowing. Um, but it's really, really important to be very careful when you hear sex difference. If anybody's talking about humans, immediately, immediately realize that they're talking about average differences and you wanna know what's the effect size, how much overlap is there, and so on. So the next principle that I wanted to talk about was mosaicism. And mosaicism is an idea that's been around for a very long time. Um, but it hasn't actually been taken up um, uh, in a very significant way in human, uh, in theorizing about sex differences until quite recently. I'm going to give a little bit of short shrift to mosaicism because so much of what Daphne is going to talk about does such an elegant and beautiful demonstration of it. Um, but I just wanted to note that here, you know, the point is not to argue that there are no structural or functional brain differences between the sexes or genders, but to draw attention to the fact that neural characteristics are not so distinctly different that reliable sex differences are easily identified. So there are many different ways to model psychological femininity or masculinity. Our folk model treats these as if they're package deals with elements that predictably go together. So if you're nurturing, you'll probably enjoy cooking, be good at language like flowers, right, <laughs> and music, take baths. Those, those models that Natalie showed you in the beginning are folk models for masculinity and femininity. They lumped all the girl things in one brain and all the boy things in another brain. And that's the, this notion of how it works. Um, uh, so here are two early models for thinking about um, how masculinity and femininity clustered into packages of traits. And this one is the, this is the idea that the sexes cluster distinctly at one end or the other, and that th th these are the normal positions to be in, and that anywhere in between here is abnormal, atypical, problematic, etc. Um, this is a very old way of thinking. And the idea, it's important to note that on this model, it's the bipolar model, being more feminine automatically makes you less masculine. And being more masculine automatically makes you less feminine. Well, in, by the very late 60s, early 70s, in a number of realms of psychology and neuroscience, um, a new model, this orthogonal model, came in. And in human psychology, Sandra Bem is very famous for having done this. But there are other folks that did this too. Bruce McEwen's work on, um, on aromatization and noticing uh, distinctive estrogen and androgen pathways in brain organization is very important for this orthogonal model. So it's interesting, people in really different 
realms of brain science were coming up with this around the same time. Here, masculinity and femininity, femininity traits still distinctly line up together in, in there, but they're different dimensions. So you can end up feminine but not masculine, but you could also end up feminine and masculine. You can end up masculine but not feminine, or you could end up neither. Um, androgynous in a way that's not both, but that's neither. It's interesting to notice that that bipolar model, actually, you could think of it as it cutting straight through here um, without those other positions, those possibilities. And a lot of people still tend to treat um, sex and gender differences this way, but evidence is accumulating that it doesn't work like that at all. Instead, there's a mosaic. And this mosaic model um, uh, is, has been conceptually out there for a while, and, and lately there have been a number of really sophisticated new kinds of statistical analyses that have started to demonstrate that it really works this way. And, and Daphne will give you a, a beautiful demonstration of that. But the point here is, if you think about, I'm going to take it back to this. If this is uh, masculinity and femininity, in the brain, instead of it all being on one dimension where things line up together, there are multiple dimensions. Where do we get these ideas of masculine and feminine traits? Well, in psychology, what's been done for decades is you go out, you test a whole bunch of people, and you find those things that where the group of women, on average, differ from the group of men. And then that becomes one of the things that's validated as a sex-differentiated trait. In a large group, you might get many, many different characteristics and traits that do differ um, between the males and the females. You might think of this as a population average or midpoint for any number of gender-typed traits. So this is the population average score for nurturing, for femininity, for um, uh, physical aggression, for verbal abilities, for three-dimensional spatial abilities, and so on. Each one of these things out here moves from some feminine dimension to a masculine dimension. If you look at them in a population way, um, you, you pull all those traits out, you line them up, you get the score in your population, and you see where do males score, where do females score, et cetera. And the folk model makes us think that um, individual people are also going to line up that way. But in fact, what we have is a population mean where males tend to fall on one side and females tend to fall on the other side. What do individuals look like? Well, this is something that, you know, this is that androgynous, somebody who's right around the mean, all the way down, a bunch of different characteristics, right? Here's another possibility, person B, is this very feminine person, where uh, all of the scores, except for one at the midpoint, tend to be over here. This is our normative conception, but this turns out to be a pretty rare person. Class, ethnicity, nation, age, sexualities, etc. Actually, it means there's another part that I must have accidentally left off this slide or accidentally deleted in my mania. And contingency is also meant to capture the um, the principle of plasticity that Ray talked about a little bit, so that um, that the state that you have right now, the state that, that uh, is, has developed the trait you have, can change depending on a new condition. That new condition could be a new hormone exposure. It could be castration if you're doing an experimental animal. It could also be, this is a great example, um, where um, there's, I don't dispute that early hormone exposures um, significantly affect the brain. The really interesting thing, though, is that I believe that a lot of the research has taken that wonderful, strong model and has held it too tightly because we need to connect that with what we do know about plasticity. And for decades, we've understood that even some of the behaviors that were organized by early hormone exposures could very quickly be changed by other kinds of interventions, things like the, the um, handling of an animal or how they were caged, what other uh, animals were with them, what kind of sexual exposure they were given, and so on. 
Um, so contingency captures both of these things. This is, I'm just going to give you one example of contingency. And this is, I took this from uh, Janet Hyde's most recent meta-analysis. I redrew it to fit. These are effect sizes for gender differences in personality across two meta-analyses, giant meta-analyses, based on the big five model is this uh, big five domains of personality that, um, in which there are consistent, reliable sex differences across samples. What's fascinating here is that you see, notice where these studies were done. Um, the Feingold study, uh-oh, I didn't put it in there, and I'm not positive, but I think that Feingold is also a US adult study, but I can't swear to that. Look at these, though. We've got US adults. Maybe this was the original uh, Big Five personality study. Um, Costa is looking at US adults here, contrasted with Japanese adults, and over here with black South Africans. Look at the difference in effect sizes. A 0.08 effect size is a completely negligible, uh, it's simply not a difference at all. A 0.4 effect size is considered a moderate difference. In something that's seen, neuroticism and anxiety has been seen as one of the personality dimensions that's really an important sex difference. In particular, this one is interesting because it has been related to depression and to some of the mental illnesses uh, like, like eating disorders that do vary reliably between males and females. But if you notice in different settings, the extent to which that even is a sex difference is dramatically different. The same thing is true for all of these other ones. Agreeableness and tender-mindedness being a really huge one. You find a huge sex difference in Feingold, and over here, nothing at all, um, and only a third uh, of the size when you go to the Japanese sample or the current US sample. So. Um, Aggression in context, aggression is another one. I don't have a, a nice uh, graph for it, but in some of the studies, but um, some of the work um, that I analyzed years ago with a, a mentor of mine, Evan Balaban, we did a, um, a piece on looking at sex differences in the neurobiology of aggression, and that the contextual factors were so important across all of the animal models, not just humans. The type of aggression, the type of cue was, with humans is gender made salient or observers present. And the, the real world consequences are very, very important and, and actually can't be extracted out of uh, a lot of the data that we have. Okay, so the last principle I wanna talk about is entanglement. And entanglement is um, the idea that Sex and gender, the initially, the, the idea that in humans, sex and gender can be conceptually distinguished, and that, that distinction has been incredibly important for a lot of scholarship. But for experimental work, you almost never can actually distinguish the two um, when you're looking at a brain or behavioral outcome in humans. And that's because the gendered environment has been affecting brain behavior from the, the absolute moment of birth at least, if not now, um, from the moment of the sonogram when people get knowledge of the sex difference and begin speaking differently to the fetus and so on. But So the really important notion here is that a lot of my colleagues and I have begun to use the, the, the word sex slash gender as one thing when we're talking about the variables in brain research to reflect entanglement. And also, that the entanglement of object and experiment, which I'll, I'll just show you. I'm not going to say much about it. It'll be just sort of, I'll evoke what I mean by that. Now, when I say, I want to show you why this is different. I stole this from a, a, um, an article uh, that Art uh, is a co-author on with Margaret McCarthy. I just want to show you that when you're doing animal research, just you have these nice, wonderful opportunities to do clean models where you can differentiate and you can you can castrate, you can add hormones in, you can take them out, you can do all of that. Meanwhile, keep in mind over here as a background, all the animals are being treated exactly the same. They're being housed in similar conditions. They're being fed the same ways. Um, they're, the condition is as stable as possible all across. In humans, 
you not only don't have control over the broad group, but you have a systematic bifurcation of the treatment of the animals based on sex, based on observed and assigned sex from the beginning. So you have all along the way um, different inputs. The brain only develops in context. We need input in order to, to have um, the synapses both form and prune and all of that. So the context becomes matter. It's not like they're separate. It's not like you have nature and nurture. The context transforms the biology that then becomes the substrate for the behaviors that we observe. That's really the important point. Likewise, I'll just skip that. It's the same point, basically. You can't do this kind of research in humans. Still, the basic sort of um, uh, old school idea of brain research is that you have biology that begins down here, uh, and this is the sex difference, you could call it a real essentialist model, of an individual that over the course of lifetime, they're developing along and sex is doing its thing. Then you do your experiment, you get your result, and you can, anything that's different, you can link it back to the, the underlying sex difference, making sure that, you know, to the extent possible in the experiment that you haven't treated people differently in the experiment itself. But of course, this is, this just needs to get complicated. First of all, um, I just thought we ought to throw in there that we want to know, this is sort of a placeholder for more complexity of biology itself. And to remember, I, I think I need to change the content of the slide, but the point here is to remember that sex is not one thing in the body. Sex is multiple things. And sometimes you're interested in chromosomes, sometimes you're interested in hormones, sometimes you're interested in, uh, in entirely different uh, you know, uh, neurotransmitters. Let's say you're interested in differences in the way hormone receptors are distributed in a particular structure, et cetera. You need to uh, be very specific about which part of that. Sex is a tricky variable. In some of the work that we've heard tonight, sex is both the outcome of processes, the sex dimorphism, even if you're talking about you know, the uh, dimorphic reproductive structures, that's an outcome of processes that are themselves attributed to sex. Do you see the problem? It can't be both the independent and the dependent variable. You have to get specific or else it's both of those things. Um, so entanglement means that in humans, you don't just go straight from biology here, but that from the very beginning, gendered activities, model learning, gendered reinforcement, gender typing, all of these aspects of gender socialization are not just separately affecting the experiment, but that they actually are transforming the biology that's of, of interest to us, us, which is the brain. And over here, all these other aspects of, we just, this is where I talked about the, the in entanglement of the observer and the results. All of these aspects are extremely important in any research, which all good scientists know that, but there are aspects of um, thinking about the shape of sex difference that really need to be paid attention to in doing this with human research. Now the other really interesting thing here is that gender socialization creates this special situation where even if somebody might perform differently elsewhere, in the experiment, if you make their gender salient, there's a lot of good evidence that this can also affect experimental results. And finally, this is the real entanglement slide. If you go from your experiment to your result, your result loops back up and it gets in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and you make a big splash, and you talk about the dimorphic <laughs> the results that you saw, and that loops back around and becomes part of gender socialization, and it feeds back into your very experiment. That you have to take into account that the work that we do has real-world meaning and real-world effects. Even in our very experiments, the final thing that I would show is, instead of just a result, we have to keep in mind that these results are snapshots, and that the differences that we see today 
are differences of precise moments in time. We should think of the brain and behavior as an interim phenotype because of plasticity and because of all the different ways that we know it's possible to change. So here are a few references that I would give you. Happy birthday, Barner. Thank you very much. behind so I just want to you know as somebody who sort of follows this field and the reactions that people have to it there is a lot of complaint among particularly say you know evolutionary psychologists and others that this is more political than it is scientific uh, and people talk about the difference between equity feminism and um, gender feminism has been applied to Janet Hyde too, that somehow there's, there's a, a political component that we have to get rid of to be uh, objective and true to the science. How, how do you feel about that, these complaints that continue to be lodged? Um, I think that it's, there's an enormous literature out there, there that demonstrates um, that from actually we can, many different literatures, from philosophy of science, from, uh, from uh, analyses internal to the scientific disciplines and so on. Um, science, unfortunately, is not hermetically sealed from the rest of the world. Science is a social activity. Scientists get their ideas about experiments. They get their hypotheses and theories. Um, from the world around them, which includes their scientific learning and scientific world, but it's not restricted to that. Um, some of the most crass ways that we know that the outside world, the political world, affects science, Ray gave us an excellent example. Um, the, a shift in funding priority because of what was hot can kill an entire promising line of research. One thing that's really important to recognize is that um, even though some people might say they're not, you know, and there are definitely there are folks that are not looking at sex and that, that um, I think have a lot of biases around um, uh, the idea that male animals in particular are gonna be, it's more homogenous, it's a cleaner experiment if you only study males, that, that's still definitely true. But it's also true that um, sex differences is more than a cottage industry. It's really, really a good ticket to getting attention for your work. And attention for your work means funding for your work and a high profile. And that, you know, there, there really is um, a political environment that we operate in. I think that last slide that I showed with entanglement, uh, I wanted to, I, was, I took it away because I was trying to get, give ja Daphna a jump start. I think it's pointless to pretend that we don't actually uh, operate in a broad social context, and I think it's dangerous to pretend that we don't, because we care about how humans are. Um, it matters. It has real consequences in the world. Um, Cordelia Fine has done fantastic work on, uh, on synthesizing a bunch of different studies that demonstrate that uh, the more that people uh, believe in dichotomous sex differences, the more that they hear about um, sex difference research in a way that they then they believe that what has been described as dichotomous and not changeable and inevitable, and that that's linked with uh, a lot of different and not necessarily great consequences. That stereotype threat is stronger in girls who hold those beliefs. Um, there is less support for equality among people who support those beliefs. So those are some of the ways. Finally, I would just say that um, that Janet Hyde's work is beautiful scientifically. It's methodologically sophisticated and rich. Um, I think uh, I work very, very, very hard to be really rigorous about the data that I look at. I try to be extremely precise and careful. And you know there are many, many, many people doing this kind of analysis. This is a very insider kind of critique. This isn't a, you know, it has political consequences, but it's very much on the terms of science. 
Okay, so um, we will move on. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're running very late. <laughs> yeah, we're running late, sorry. But, um, yes, it's Professor Daphne Joel, and she's going to be telling us about the mosaic brain. So, first, thank you for staying. We are running late, so I try to keep it short. Uh, I will talk about the mosaic, but I want to start with a little bit going out and thinking about the way we think about sex differences. We were hearing a lot about sex differences today. Of course, there are sex differences in the brain, behavior, in attitude, etc. And what I want to suggest is that the way we think about sex differences in brain and behavior, etc., is strongly influenced by uh, the sex differences we know the best, which are sex differences in the reproductive system. And what I want to suggest is that we, because we know that sex differences in the reproductive system almost always add up to create one of two distinct systems, a, a male reproductive system or a female reproductive system, we also think that sex differences in other domains, such as the brain, act the same way. So sex differences in the brain also add up to create one of two distinct systems, a male brain and a female brain. And what I want to show you today is that sex differences in brain behavior and everything else except the reproductive system are very, very different from sex differences in the reproductive system. So let's start with these. So what's special about sex differences in the reproductive system is that they are very, very large and internally consistent. In internally consistent, I mean that if you have a male form in one of your organs, then all your organs are typically male and you won't have any female organs. So usually you won't have a penis and a womb in the same person, although this happens. And we can appreciate these two features or characteristics of sex differences in the reproductive system. If we look at this great wall of vagina by Jamie McCartney, well, this will keep you up, but <laughs> anyway, it's better term a great wall of female external genitals, and if we compare this great wall to a great wall of male external genitals, which I've created using uh, Google Images. <laughs> And what you can easily appreciate is that there is within sex variability, so not all males look the same, not all females look the same, but there is really very little overlap between the two systems. And also you can see that they are highly consistent, so you don't see these mixtures of features from the two types. And there are people that do have a mixture of both female and male organs, but they are very rare, relatively. Now, if we compare this, uh, this, these great walls to great walls of male brains and female brains, we see something very different. So in a few minutes, I'll explain exactly how we created these images. But for now, it's enough to understand that each line here represents the brain of a single subject. The column most to the left is a subject sex. So you see that all the brains on the left are for males, and all those from the right are for females. And the rest is just some features of the brain. And again, I'll explain exactly how we created this. But for now, what I want you to look is how variable the human brain is, how brains are so different from one another, and the huge overlap between the brains of males and females. So what's the difference? Why? Oh, OK. What's the difference? Why do sex differences in the reproductive system almost always add up to create a male reproductive system or a female rep reproductive system? And only rarely we see mixing, whereas in the brain it is exactly the opposite. And what I want to show you is that this difference between the two systems is because sex is the most important factor in determining the form of the different organs of the reproductive system, whereas it is only one of several factors that interact to determine the form of brain features. Or in other ways, that the, another uh, way is that the effects of sex may be different and in fact even opposite under different conditions. And I want to demonstrate this last principle looking more closely on a single study of a tiny piece of the brain, which are dendritic spines. 
So you can see here a, a neuron in green with this uh, dendrite, and the small little dots al along the dendrites are dendritic spines. And here you can see a dendrite, a piece of dendrite from a male rat and a piece from a female rat. And then I added red uh, arrows so we can see uh, more accurately the spines. And you can clearly see a sex difference. So this is how a sex difference in the brain may look like. Uh, the male has less spines compared to the female. So the first conclusion is that sex affects brain structure. But there was another group of rats in this study and these rats underwent 15 minutes of stress. Not very much, you know, like getting stuck in traffic in New York probably takes more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so after 15 minutes of stress, we also see a sex difference. But this time it is reversed. It's exactly the opposite. So it's the same, same dendrites. The dendrites above are XY and XY. They have lots of testosterone in the body. The dendrites below are XX and XX. They have less testosterone, more estradiol in the body. So sex is the same, but the effects of sex on the brain are completely opposite under different conditions. Though this, of course, never happens in the reproductive system. So regardless of how stressed I am, my uh, clitoris will not turn into a penis, and I assure you, your penis will not uh, turn into clitoris. It is funny because it never happens in the uh, <laughs> reproductive system, but it happens a lot in the brain. So such effects as I've just shown you have been demonstrated in many regions of the brain, for different features of the brain, not just in rhythmic morphology, but also size of specific nuclei, uh, receptor density, etc., and following different manipulations, not just acute stress, but also chronic stress, stressed experience already in the uterus, after other types of manipulation, etc. Now, what's interesting about these studies, all done in animals, is that it is not that the entire brain flips from the male form to the female form, or vice versa. Only some parts of the brain change their sex, others do not change. And what this means is that even if at some specific point I assume that all features of the brain were female, then following such an event, some features will change their sex and I'll have a mixture, a brain with both male and female features. So this is where my idea of the mosaic came from. So now you can see the mosaic brain. And what we wanted to do is estimate how common this phenomenon of mixing is in the human brain. So to do this, we looked at data of structural imaging in humans, and this is a group that uh, helped me do this. And we took, probably you know these images, so we took structural imaging from MRI of different subjects. We used some templates to delineate within each brain 116 regions, and then for each region and for each subject, we calculated the average density. So here you can see, this will get us to the images we started with. So we have this huge Excel file, for each subject, we have the sex on the left column, and then we have 116 uh, numbers for the density of the 116 regions. Next, we look at sex differences. So where do we see the sex differences in the brain? And here you see a map of sex differences. We use the same coins that uh, Beck was talking about. Uh, and it's enough to understand that the more a region is red, it means that the density on average in females was greater than in males. More green means the opposite. And you can see that there are many sex differences, but they are very small. So this is the largest, you all already know this, so this is the largest sex difference in this sample. Uh, so you can see the density, the distribution of density in females in red and in males in green. You can see that there is a sex difference, on average females have a higher density, but you can also see the great overlap. And compare this to the very large or clear separation we saw in the genitals. But what I want to ask is not so much about the overlap, but I want to ask is our brains internally consistent? So if I have a female form, regardless of my sex, if I have a female form, in, if one, in one of my brain features, will all, will all my brain be female? Or would I have a mixture of both male and female features? So to do this, we need to define what's male and what's female for each region. And we started by looking only at eight regions, which showed the largest sex differences. Because as you remember, the sex differences were mostly small. So for each of these eight regions, we looked at the actual distributions of males and females for this region, and defined the female form and the male form, and then went back to the data to define for each subject whether it has a male or female form. So we do it step by step. So first we 
use a color code, of course, pink for girls or women, uh, uh, blue for uh, men, and we color the sex. Remember, this was the first column. And then we go to the first region and we color the uh, first region, whether it was the male or the female form. Now, we are not surprised to see that there are some females with a male form and some males with a female form. This is a direct, consequences, a direct consequence of the overlap. Okay? What we are interested in is what will happen in the second region. If I had a female form in the first region, would I also have a female form in the next region? And you can see that not necessarily. And then we look at the third region, and again we see mixing. And we look at all eight regions, and we see lots of mixing. So many brands have both pink and blue. And if we look at the entire sample, which was about 280 uh, men and women, then you can see that there is lots of pink in the blue brands, lots of blue in the pink brands, but must, what is more important is that there are many brands that have both pink and blue. And again, compare this to the uh, human reproductive system, which doesn't have mixing, or mixing occurs in about 1% of subjects. In our sample, it occurred in 80% of brains. So there is a huge difference between sex differences in the brain and in the reproductive system. Now I want to get to the images I started with. So up until now, we were looking at only eight regions and looking at the dichotomous division into male and female, which is, of course, not relevant for brains because brain features do not come in one of two forms. They come in, you know, there's some kind of normal distribution of density. So instead of using this dichotomous male-female, we use a continuous scale from highly feminine, if you want, to highly masculine. And for the rest of the brain, the 100 regions that we haven't looked at up until now, we use another continuous uh, scale from yellow to green. And then we get this. Okay, but this is how we created these images. So again, you see how variable each of us is and how overlapping the brains of males and females are. So we wanted to see maybe this is specific to Israeli brains, you know. <laughs> So we went to an open data source of international uh, um, imaging from different countries, and we did the same. So we have more humans now, so about 850, which is many brains for imaging. And I'll show you just the results of the regions that are showing the largest sex differences, not the entire brain. And I'll use a continuous scale, and this is what we get. So the left two columns are of male brains, uh, right to call the female brains, you can see the huge mixing. You can see that many brains have both dark uh, pink and dark blue in the same brain, so we can be extremely male and extremely female in the same brain. And in this sample, 100% uh, uh, had mixed brains, not just 80 as in the Israeli sample. So if I just summarize this sex and the brain, then what we see is that there are many sex differences in the brain, but they are very, very different from the characteristics of sex differences in the reproductive system. They are highly overlapping and they are not internally consistent. Therefore, they cannot be divided into two types, male brains and female brains. Human brains do not come in two forms. They come in multiple forms. This is only nine examples out of the 280 that you see in the lines. And this is, of course, completely different from human reproductive system, which do mostly come in one of two forms, male or female. So what about human behavior, personality characteristics, cognitive abilities, all these things that show sex differences? Can we divide humans into men and women on the basis of these differences? So we did exactly the same as we did with brains, but just with gender-related data. So again, we used an open data source of uh, Americans, so now you have to trust it. And uh, it's about 5,000 people, young people, you can see the age range. And again, we chose only the variables that show the largest sex differences, and you can easily, you know, they are familiar. So women have, on average, uh, they are more depressed, they ha have better, better or higher femininity scores, uh, they perceive their weight to be higher, uh, and they have better self-control than men. So this will be the feminine traits in our uh, uh, data set. And men are, on average, more impulsive, uh, show more violent behavior, do more gambling and more active in sport. Uh, and I can't show you this too many uh, humans, so I just show you the results. So we found mixing of feminine and masculine traits here in 97% of subjects. Okay, so three subjects were, 3% were consistent. All the rest were uh, mixed. 
And we saw a lot of mixing. So 80% had at least two features out of the eight, which were feminine and two features which were masculine. 45% had at least three of each. Four is half and half, right? So we see a lot of uh, mixing in humans. And people on average had 40% of characteristics which were inappropriate for their sex, right? Because they are, like, if I'm a female and I have 40% masculine traits, they are not appropriate to my sex. So let me summarize. There are sex differences in many systems, in the reproductive system, brain, behavior, immune system, liver, etc., etc., etc. But what I hope to manage to show you is that not all sex differences are equal. And whereas this view that we have that sex differences add up to create two distinct systems is quite good when we talk about the human reproductive system, it is completely wrong when we think about human brain or human behavior, attitudes, and other gender characteristics. Therefore, we should abandon this male-female a brain view or this division that we are all using all the time of men and women, boys and girls, because there is no scientific evidence, even in the gendered world we live in, that people come in two forms. But we treat people all the time as if they are coming in two forms. We say all the boys, you go play out in the yard, all the girls, you do something else, as if people come in with a set of, of uh, traits. Instead of doing this, we should start celebrating human variability and um, variability is enough. <laughs> Be yourself. <laughs>you seen any cross-cultural differences? If you were to study a population, for example, where the men and women are separated and have distinctive roles, um, have you looked at that? I mean, is that at all reflected in any of the parameters you're looking at? Well, Beck, I think, already showed us that uh, you find different gender differences in different cultures, and this is also true for mathematics and other cognitive abilities. So clearly, in different cultures, you'll see different differences. This is because environment also affects our behavior, etc. But I think what's really interesting about these findings is that we find it in a culture that does have gender. So we are treated from the way the moment we are born, if not before that, differently. And we are directed to different directions. And still, we are mixed. So we can just imagine how more mixed and variable and happy we could have been if we didn't have gender as a social system oppressing us to be one way or another. Okay, it's getting so late, I, I'm gonna open the floor to questions um, for the people who are left, so. Oh, okay. Hi. <clears throat> this is a question for Dr. Arnold. Uh, the site in the brain, the male site for song, the, uh, which is smaller in female birds, does it have a counterpart in mammals? No, there's no, uh, I mean, there's no um, similar structure that you can point to in, in mammals. Um, you also don't have, I think, vocal control systems that are that strikingly uh, sexually dimorphic. Um, uh, so, um, there are brain regions that are homologous to this in mammals, uh, but there, but you don't, I don't know, we don't know of any instances where a vocal control region is going to be that sexually dimorphic. Um, uh, this, I think this is actually one of the most extreme sexual dimorphisms found in, in brains of any uh, vertebrate species, um, and therefore it's particularly interesting because it might show some principles that might be also true in less, um, uh, in smaller sex differences, but um, 
you can't just jump from there to mammals and look at the same kind of brain regions. This question is for Dr. Silver. Could you please elaborate on uh, how stress affects the human male and female brains differently? I think Daphna and I both have presented evidence of a similar kind that when you look at the morphology of uh, neurons in the hippocampus that they look different in the sexes, but that in response to stress, in one sex they shrink and in the other sex they expand. I focused on the morphology and Daphna focused on the receptors on those neurons. That effect, we can't really study that in humans because there's no um, method available to look at such detail at the level of neurons in humans. What people can do is look at brain imaging studies, but there you're looking at big chunks of brain, not at all giving you any clue on what's happening within individual neurons, their processes, and their receptors. So um, if we find a similar phenomenon in the same direction in the sex, in male and female, with the same hormone effects, in many different mammals. We would generally assume it also happens in humans, but the evidence today is impossible to get. I can just add that also in animals, in rats, it's not that the stress always affects or all, affects all features in the same way. So some features will say, we see opposite effects, and other features will see the same effect, and still others will see effect in one sex and not in the other. So it's very, very complex, the interaction between sex and stress. Thank you. Um, I was a poli-sci major at Barnard, so mine is a little political, but I came here because I wanted to ask um, eminent brains researchers this question. Um, I work with the Sisters of Life, which is an uh, order of sisters that do uh, pregnancy and post-abortion counseling, and we have found that many women regret their abortions immediately, and they say they weren't thinking clearly so we were wondering, uh, is there any research being done on, on the changes in the brain during pregnancy, or is that unpolitical? Or? Enormous literature on hormonal and neural changes in the brain during pregnancy in mammals. So mice, rats, primates. Um, you can't do those studies in humans. Was that your question? You can't do those studies in humans? Yeah. You can't look at the... You can't use the... You can do imaging studies, but um, if you're trying to understand um, changes at the level of neurons, you can't do that in humans. If you're... You could, I could suggest some books that you could consult where they try to uh, understand the changes that occur during pregnancy and at pregnancy termination. So Allison Fleming, um, Jay Rosenblatt, um, I guess Fleming has the most recent books where you could find the experimental literature. She's done studies that on parallel studies in humans and animals. Thank you. Hi, uh, I want to ask about um, Ma uh, male and female, like uh, when aging, like uh, when you get older, uh, is it the body or brain changes? And also, it's really popular now, people talking about hormone replacement therapies. And is there a fact when if people do the hormone replacement therapies, will they affect their brain? Placement therapy affect the brain. So first is does aging how does aging affect the brain? Yeah. So if I'm understanding correctly, you're asking how does 
not just how does aging affect the brain, but does that interact with sex? Does, does aging affect male and female brains differently? And then your second question has to do with hormone replacement and what do we know about brain effects from hormone replacement? The first thing. Okay. <laughs> so there are studies in human imaging studies, structural imaging studies, showing that the sex differences change while we grow older, so you find different sex differences in human brains at different ages. So this answers your first question. And I don't know about studies, that doesn't mean that there aren't of the effect of hormone replacement therapy, but surely they affect the brain, everything affects the brain. This talk affects the brain, so. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for speaking tonight. Um, this question is directed towards Dr. Joel and Jordan Young. Um, I'm wondering in those mosaic studies, um, how you guys measured um, like characteristics, sex characteristics. I'm sorry, so you guys In the mosaic studies that we saw, how did, how was um, sex characteristics, how were they measured? And then also I'm wondering if they extended into like the physical realm. I was wondering if you guys measured like physical features. Uh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, this is a question for Dad, actually. The, the pictures that I showed um, were abstract conceptual pictures to give you the model. Um, but it, those, the, um, the ways that, how can I say that? What I was talking about was primarily features of personality and behavior. So it, it was generalizing the way that modeling uh, underlies measurement for personality and behavior. And uh, so those measures have been created usually by starting with um, ideas about how males and females differ, coming up with questions, giving those questions to mixed group populations, and then seeing on which questions do the groups really differ. So there's, uh, the, the questions are directed um, with an eye towards identifying precisely those domains where there will be the most difference. So there, the domains have been selected and the measures are usually selected in order to maximize difference because people are trying to model the structure of gender. And then I think she had a question for you, Daphna, about how were the measures that you used, both in the behavioral and in the structural analyses, chosen? So we did the same. We chose the uh, variables that showed the largest sex difference. Because if we use everything, then we won't have it. Of course, we'll get mixing, because you have such huge overlap. So we did it against our theory. So we, we chose the ones that show the, the largest sex differences to categorize into which domain it went into. So like, was it a questionnaire? Was it like, you know what I mean? Yeah, this is open data source, so you can go and, and see, but there are questionnaires, there are specific questions. So th there are open data source, everyone can use them. Usually they have instructions of how you can create the measures. We did some additional analysis, but this is very technical. You can ask me later if you want. I'm wondering what the implications of the mosaic model, what the implications are for institutions at the institutional level, for example, Barnard College. How does that play into admissions and how do you think this research will further perpetuate? I, I will not talk about Barnard College, but they uh, still have to pay my ticket. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will talk about single sex education and not about Barnard College actually. There is a strong movement for single sex education in the United States, as you may know, and hundreds of schools are already enrolled in this. And the logic for this is not the same as Bernard, is that male brains and female brains are so different, so girls and boys just need something very different. And therefore, they should be educated in different classes. And I think what the mosaic um, hypothesis in the data I show, show that this is well, I try to be polite. This is complete rubbish. <laughs> and, and I think it's important because what these schools are doing, they are having an effect. So the science is, there are no science, but they have an effect, a strong effect. And many schools are joining them. 
So I think this is what you should do, you know, try to fight this. I would like, I would like to briefly, hello, hello. I want to just briefly actually do connect it to Barnard because I think it's important that we keep in mind what is the point of a single sex college at this point in time and is that rationale similar to the, the kinds of you know, single sex education arguments that have been made. You know, if we think back to the founding of Barnard College, Barnard wasn't founded on the principle that women needed a special college because they thought so differently and they needed teachers to speak softly to them and they needed a place where they wouldn't be forced to learn math and they could, you know, it was precisely the opposite. Um, we needed Barnard because of the idea that women's brains were so different from male brains that they didn't belong in higher education. And we have to remember that, you know, difference versus similarity, neither one of them is our hero, neither one of them is the villain. We have to know how they're precisely used in a particular argument. And single sex education can be argued from equity perspectives, from social perspectives, from the legacy of an institution, or it can be argued uh, in these modes, and if you think to that example I gave about what happens if you misclassify and give the wrong treatment, well, think about some white learning style that's supposedly a male or female learning style, and you know, doing these the Leonard Sachs style uh, single sex education, you're using the wrong style as much of the time as you are the right one. Piping in. I want to say that there's some, some of the things we talked about are based on evidence that many people, where many people get exactly the same result using the same method, and we, we know these things to be true. Some of the, that's, that's the science part of it. Then there's what do you make of the science? Barnard, the, the, reason for existence of Barnard and Barnard's admission policies are judge judgments made outside of the science. And one of the things that in, in my classes, and I think in many Barnard classes, we try to teach is where is the science and where is the opinion and judgment and what are we gonna do about it? Um, my question is, do the terms, when we talk about behavior now, do the terms masculinity and femininity even still have any usefulness? What could we do differently? Like, how could we talk about this in a whole new way? I would suggest uh, switching from uh, uh, descriptive terms like this to uh, qualitative, qualitative terms, like more dense, bigger, uh, smarter, better in mathematics, whatever, but move to quantitative terms and not assign it to sex. terms even mean anything. I mean, we didn't get into any of the, the whole transgender movement. And I know among young people, there just seems to be much more of an acceptance of gay marriage, of sexual fluidity. It seems like it's all moving in that direction. Um, are we kind of maybe almost passe at this point by looking at sex differences? I'll say something about it. Yes, I think so. I think that um, because the, the model that we're so attached to it, it's very interesting, it's been, and it's, it's a reliable model, and I say this a lot, that science is like the law, it's built on precedent. It's hard to move away from a model that you've been using for a very, very long time. Variables that we feel like have been really useful. And in particular, in this way, you know, Natalie, you started this out saying, we um, 
socially find sex to be so very important that we can't even, there are all kinds of wonderful social psychology studies that show that it's almost impossible to relate to somebody. It's very difficult for most people to even speak to someone and meet their eyes if they don't know if they're speaking to a male or a female. Socially, these are really profound. And I think that what is interesting, this gets us into a realm where there's a lot of interesting scientific work going on right now in the gap between what we think we're doing and the implicit processes that we have, whether it's implicit biases that, so we believe that we're treating everybody the same, but there are lots of clever ways to actually figure out that even things that we ex truly, in a committed way, don't want to do, if they fit with stereotypes, most of us tend to do them in a lot of situations. My hope is that by bringing forward more of the data on the, the normality of great internal flexibility and variety in personality structure, for example, that that will, um, if nothing else, help people to relax a little bit about the ways in which they and their kids don't conform to these stereotypes. I think one of the most interesting phenomena around the discussion of transgender right now is not so much what it means about not conforming, but the implicit idea that everybody who identifies as male or female actually is homogenous, that we all share some core features of personality and so on. And I think that's the next horizon. I think that that's, that's what Daphne's work is pointing towards. Counseling gender. Yeah. yeah. I just want to be a little more radical and say, what is we? So I don't know, maybe in New York this is true what you were saying, but I don't think in other, you know, all the United States this is true. Definitely it's not true in places that are not Western world, which is most of the world are not Western world and not New York. So I think in we, you know, we should be a little more um, cautious. And, and I think gender is a huge problem in, around the world. And most people that are poor are females, still. Maybe not here, I don't know. Uh, so, here too, okay. <laughs> okay, so I think gender is still a huge problem. It's one of the, the causes for a lot of violence against people, mostly women, et cetera, et cetera. So gender is still a huge problem. And I think uh, the problem is with the popular science, so although I think uh, Beck wrote a great book. I think uh, Luan Brizenden with the male brain and female brain sell, sold much more books than... Okay, so this, this is what people... Yeah, okay, so this is the male brain and the female brain. Okay, so don't bite. So, so but I think, you know, people, this, this is what people want to hear. They want to hear that the way things are, which are still not equal even here, the way things are, are exactly as they should be. And here we can sh show you that they have testosterone, we don't, and now we can all, you know, understand everything and we can go home and we don't have to bother in changing the world. But we do need to change the world. Not just this, but today we're talking about gender with our other things. But with, for sure we need to change gender, and gender is a huge human problem. It's not a scientific problem. 